Farmers are not just accused for killing the reef by pesticides and mud. Farm fertiliser is supposedly killing the reef too. Now, for farmers, this accusation is a big deal because the Queensland government has instituted draconian legislation against the farmers to limit fertiliser usage. And this will have ultimately a considerable effect on farm productivity. So the accusation goes that the farm fertiliser runs off the farm down the rivers, across the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon uh, to the Great Barrier Reef. So according to the Queensland government, this leads to degraded water quality on the reef, impacting reef health and its resilience to climate change. This runoff is also a contributor to outbreaks of coral-eating crown-of-thorn starfish. The starfish outbreaks are one of the major factors contributing to coral cover declines across the Great Barrier Reef. Now, remember that fertiliser is not like a poison. In fact, it's the opposite of a poison. It helps plants grow, after all. So we're not talking about a noxious chemical. On the other hand, you can have too much of a good thing, and one of the claims is that the fertiliser promotes the growth of algae, which displaces the corals on the Great Barrier Reef. And also, there's the problem, perhaps, of the Cranithorn starfish outbreaks, which they claim are related to the nutrients. Now, we've discussed in previous episodes the Cranithorn starfish plagues, and demonstrated how the link with fertilisers is extremely ten tenuous. So, for example, the place where the, the uh, plagues tend to start, near Lizard Island, is an extremely long way away from the biggest source of nutrients, which is the Burdekin River. And in addition to that, the plagues, which occur so regularly on the Swains Reef, the most regular uh, plagues of all, are furthest away from the coast in an area which is totally and utterly unaffected by a uh, river runoff. But in this video, we will take a detailed look at the nutrients in the Great Barrier Reef and show that what comes from the land is actually really just a, like a drop in the bucket because there's huge amounts of nutrients moving around in the system already. We'll also look at the phenomenon called flushing, which is the amount of time that water resides in the lagoon and the reef and how fast it's flushed to the Pacific Ocean and the Coral Sea. Please like and subscribe. Scientists claiming that nutrients from farms is damaging the reef often talk about river runoff and they tend to imply that there's a huge amount of water heading towards the reef from the rivers. And yes, some of those rivers are big. The Burdekin River is huge. It's almost a kilometre across. And for the few days that it, it floods it each year, it can be 10 metres deep. So it's very spectacular when it happens. But frankly, even the Burdekin River is pretty pathetic when it comes to volume of water compared with the massive rivers of salt water that flows into and out of the Great Barrier Reef and Lagoon from the massive ocean currents. This map shows actual data of the ocean currents around the Great Barrier Reef. Huge currents sweep in from the east. Some of the water heads north in the North Queensland Current the East Australia Current, which heads south, is over 100 kilometres across and flows 100 metres deep, or more. The other currents, such as the North Banu R2 Jet, are a similar size. These currents are worth over 10,000 times the Burdekin River. In fact, Chukran and colleagues calculated that there is as much flow in and out due to the large ocean currents in just eight hours as comes down all the rivers in a whole year. Eight hours of ocean currents is worth a whole year of river inflow. So what you can see here is that, in fact, it's the ocean currents that dominate the water quality of the Great Barrier Reef. Now this crucial fact is almost always completely ignored in the major documents such as the 2019 consensus statement on the Great Barrier Reef. In oceanography, the flushing time or residence time of a water body is extremely interesting when you're contemplating the effects of pollution. So the flushing time is effectively the time the drop of water will stay in a region before it gets flushed away. So for example, the flushing time for Sydney Harbour is roughly 225 days. So if you put a drop of water somewhere towards the top of Sydney Harbour, it will take about 225 days before it reaches out 
to the, the sea through Sydney Heads. Now, for the Baltic Sea, the flushing time is 25 years because it's enclosed by Sweden, Poland and Germany. It's an extremely enclosed water body and a 25 year flushing time makes it extremely susceptible to pollution. So what about the Great Barrier Reef? Well, it turns out that the outer reef, the main reef, the flushing time is a couple of weeks. That's how long the average drop of water resides in there before it flushes back out to the Coral Sea. Now, this flushing time of a couple of weeks has been experimentally derived using four different methods, using radionuclei, using satellite track drifters, and using conservation of salt and heat. It's also been modelled with hydrodynamic models, so it's a very, very solid result. Now, the situation for the mediocre fringing reefs, the ones very close to the coast, is a little different because it's a long way from the coast out to the uh, Coral Sea. But even for those, the flushing time is a couple of months. And it must be remembered that, well, there's not very much coral there either. But a flushing time of a couple of months means that there's a very limited ability for the small amount of pollution that comes off the farms to build up. But there's another reason why nutrients in particular are not a problem. And that's because there is a phenomenally huge amount of nutrients that are already in the system, trapped in the sediment, and that these nutrients cycle between the sediment and the seawater above. The amount of nutrient cycling is far greater than what comes down the rivers. So this diagram is from the work of Miles Furness, and it is a cross-section from the rivers on the left, where the nutrients come in, and the reef out on the right on the uh, deep ocean. Now, the numbers on this, this uh, diagram represent the relative sizes of the nitrate flu or the nitrogen fluxes. So one unit of nitrogen falls down in the rain. There's a surprising amount of nitrogen and nitrates in the rain. There's only about two units comes down all the rivers. And there's another one unit, probably more, which is caused by the fixation of nitrogen from an algae called trichodesmium. We then have about another unit of uh, nitrogen which is upwelled from the deep water ocean. So you can see already that the amount of nitrogen coming from the rivers is not the only game in town. There are large other fluxes of nitrogen. But the elephant in the room is this monumental cycling flux of nitrogen across the seabed. It's over a hundred times the size of the fluxes that are coming down the rivers. This massive cycling flux occurs from a num number of ways. The first is due to the resuspension of sediment on the seabed by waves, and this releases a large amount of both dissolved and particulate nitrogen. So in this picture, which is taken after rough weather, you can see the ocean is partly brown due to the resuspension of the sediment, but it's also green due to the phytoplankton growth on the nitrogen that's released from the sediment. With time, all sorts of biological and chemical processes will mean that that nitrogen is taken back into the sediment. So it cycles around in these massive quantities. And returning to this diagram, we must remember that there are huge amounts of nitrogen coming into and out of the Great Barrier Reef on the large scale ocean currents, perhaps a hundred times more that comes in from the rivers. Now it is in very, very low concentration, but because of the huge amounts of water that come in on the ocean currents, it's very important. In fact, of the water that comes in, it only would need to leave with a 1% increase in nitrogen concentration to make up for all the extra nitrogen that comes down the rivers. So what we're seeing here is that the nitrogen budget of the Great Barrier Reef is dominated by the large cycling across the sediment water interface and also the flushing of water from the Pacific Ocean. Now, for the inshore reefs where there's perhaps 1% of the coral, even those are subjected to very, very large amounts of nitrogen due to the resuspension of the sediment. So even for those, it's the resuspension and the cycling across the sediment that is the dominant factor. Now it's true that if you have a, if you're very close to a Burdekin River flood, that will be extremely important. 
but it's very localized. It rarely even gets out to the reef. And even when it does, it has minimal effect. What is very surprising about all this is that all this work is well documented, but you will not find it uh, in the major reports on the reef like the 2019 Outlook report. Now, on occasions, people and scientists have argued, well, the river nitrogen is new nitrogen, as though somehow that makes a difference. But you cannot get this new nitrogen to build up into a system when you have this monumental flushing with the uh, Coral Sea and the Pacific Ocean. In any case, the Great Barrier should not be used to justify placing restrictions on farm fertiliser. Now, as with the other threats to the Great Barrier Reef, it was right decades ago to worry about the effect of nutrients in the 1980s, for instance. But we've got collected so much more data since then, it's now quite clear that they are not the major problem that they were first thought to be. We should stop shamefully blaming farmers for things that they are not doing, and we should be thankful that the outlook is actually extremely encouraging. Well, thanks for watching. If you want more information, they're in the Plato GBR website below. And also, if you have suggestions for topics you want us to cover in the future, put those in the comments. We read all the comments. Thanks very much.